In 1902, a French movie called Le Voyage dans la Lune was released. In English, this translates to A Trip to the Moon, and it was considered the first movie to be categorized as a science fiction flick. This movie depicted a group of brave astronomers venturing to the moon 67 years before the real thing happened. Now talk about innovation. And speaking of innovation, this week's hero was born the same year this movie was released and it all revolved around being a scout. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is September 1st, 1902, and we are in Chicago, Illinois. That's because this week's guest was born on this day. His name is Eddie Cottell nicknamed the Lawrence Flash. He played college football at Lawrence University in Appleton, so that's kind of why he got that nickname. But then he will go on to the NFL. He played for legendary coach Curly Lambeau in the Green Bay Packers from 1925 to 1929. So he was a member of the 1929 Green Bay Packers championship team. He'd also be a head coach at the collegiate level. He'd end up coaching some other sports. And then he'd come back to the NFL to be an assistant for Curly Lambeau in 1942. But I don't know if this was because of the wartime and they were losing people to the war or if it was he was naturally coming back to the NFL. I didn't really dig into that and find that piece of information. I'm imagining that it may have had something to play. But still, this is not the turning point for in the terms of when this guy, Eddie Cattell, became what many deem the father of modern scouting. No, he was hired in 1946 as the chief scout for the Los Angeles Rams, and this would be the start of something special. Again, he would ultimately be called by many the father of modern scouting because he would work tirelessly. He'd bring home top-level talent for the Rams and a major reason of their success in the 1950s and 60s. He would scout. Gower. He'd find across the nation different kinds of talent, so when they would draft, they'd have everything at the ready. And according to an article in the Sports Illustrated Talk of Fame Network, Cotel was hired by Dan Reeves. Reeves was the innovator, and Cotel was the bird dog traveling the country, they said. Once estimated, he was only home two days in a nine-month period. I mean, to me, that sounds a little stone-cold crazy, but hey, he got the job done. And they had many years of victories and they had many successful years but one point of proof was the Rams 1949 quarterback group this included Bob Waterfield Jim Hardy rookies Norm Van Brocklin and Bobby Thomason you see Waterfield and Brocklin well they went on to be Hall of Famers and Hardy because they had a plethora of quarterbacks they traded him over to a team to become a quarterback and a a top quarterback in the league for many years So, I would say that scouting, even though it was still more in its infancy stages than it is today, played a major role for the reason why the Rams were so successful back in the 50s and 60s. And from that same article comes a quote from former Chicago Cardinals personnel director Ray Garacci, and it went as such. The Rams made us all look like we were from the boonies, sleepers, busts, and franchise makers, the -the behind-the-scenes story of the pro football draft, end quote. That's pretty much what they said. Hey, they came to play. They did their homework. They knew what they needed to do, and they got the job done. We're all just sitting there in the boonies. You know, I don't know, hayfield, bonfires, and that kind of thing. But beyond that, the Rams are one of the first teams to perform extensive research on collegiate players. As far as, you know, bringing it to the draft, they were armed to the teeth when it came to drafting players. They were prepared for anything. And who was the GM for them for many years? Well. None other than legendary Tex Schramm, you know, one of the architects of America's team at the beginning. I mean, often the credits are given to the Cowboys with being the first team to really dig deep into scouting and provide innovative ways to look at players. Maybe so. But maybe Tex was influenced by his time with the Rams. And Cotel was influenced by his time with Curly Lambeau 
and Curley was considered very innovative during his time in the early NFL. So, Link, Correlation, Lampo, Textram, Scouting, let you go ahead and put the pieces together where you will. But Eddie Cotell was not the first NFL scout. Not trying to say that by a mile. But again, many do consider him the father of modern scouting, and all leading to where we are now. (laughs) But it wasn't always as structured as it is nowadays. I mean, this comes from the NFL's website. But make no mistake, there were dark ages. From the phony 40 to poor Don Carraway, who was drafted three times, twice before he was professionally eligible. Nobody bothered to check. The untold stories of scouting's past give us a perspective on who the trade's innovators really were, and an acute picture of where we'd be without them. I mean, we used to draft off the All-American teams in the newspapers, says longtime general manager Ernie Accorsi. They would have someone clip all the newspapers, compile all the numbers, and that was it. (laughs) <laughs> that was it, huh? Yeah, let's just go ahead, grab a magazine. Well, not magazine, newspaper clippings. Here's the All-Americans. Throw them on the board. Toss darts. Whoever you got, that's who you're going to have on your team next year. Let's just say NFL scouting has come a long ways since the beginning. But even at this time of Eddie Cotel, the 50s and the 60s, it would have to transform drastically to become where it is now as we sit in 2020 now the offseason towards the 101st season of the NFL. So let's go to 1976. The New York Jets at this time were one of the first teams to actually invite college seniors to team headquarters for physicals and interviews. I mean, we're talking more than a half a century after the league started, where they're like, hmm, I wonder if we should bring these guys in and figure out if they got some uh, medical issues going on there, instead of just kind of taking their word for it. And this is from Mike Hickey, former Jets director of player personnel, which He wrote an article in the New York Times in 1983, kind of describing it. He said, Besides character and intelligence, the other non-football thing we put a premium on is the medical aspect. We attempt to have every player we are interested in have an orthopedic physical by our team physicians. It takes a lot of time and costs a lot of money, but we think it is worth it. You have to cut down the odds of making a mistake. End quote. So it worked for the Jets, right? Yeah, they had some pretty good success around that time. And some other teams, such as the Cowboys and Tech Shram, they found major success as well, placing an emphasis on the scouting process. But again, this is extremely timely, extremely costly, expensive. And this is at a time when the NFL wasn't making the mooko billion bucks like it is nowadays. So they had to find something to make a difference so they, they could continue to get this data, but they wouldn't just be on the streets looking for the next meal because they couldn't even afford to draft a player because they spent too much time trying to get an MRI on the dude. So one of the biggest game changers is the NFL scouting combine. Well, let's take it back a step further because back in 1982, we're going to fly that DeLorean and we're going to go to Tampa, Florida because we're going to soak up some sun rays. But we're not here for Fun and games, we're here to watch some players play. This is the first time when the National Football Scouting Incorporated held a camp for the member NFL teams. That is the teams that were part of their organization at the time. It was called the National Invitational Camp. Stand for NIC if you hear me say NIC the rest of this episode. Basically, it's the NFL Scouting Combine. Only 163 players attended at the time, and there were really only 16 members of the National Football League a part of this National Football Scouting, so a little bit more than half at the time. Still, it was a little bit different than now. I mean, it wasn't all honky-dory because, like I said, not all the teams were there, and they weren't even organized all that well. They had to have two other camps because there's two different scouting branches that had to have their own type of camps. At the time, there were three scouting firms, National Football Scouting, Blasto, and Quadra. So, of course, they're going to hold their own little camps, too, because they don't want to be left out in the cold. And they're going to do this within a four-week period. So think about that. The logistical nightmares of senior college athletes who some of them are like, man, am I even going to have a shot at making the NFL? And if I do, I'm going to be the minimum at a time before free agency was even a thing. So talk about the salaries weren't even like the same way they are now. They're like, do I really want to go fly around to all these different places? And who knows? Maybe they even had to pay for themselves. I didn't even dig in that far. So a lot of them, they would end up deciding, 
I, I'm going to go to one or I'm going to go to two. I'm not going to go to three. So then talk about draft time. That's got to be difficult for NFL executives trying to make a decision. Well, this player didn't come to my combine that I had my scout at. So, man, I got to take word for it. I don't know. Let's just pass on him. And then, boom, bam. All you know next, he's the next superstar. So things kind of went a little bit crazy. Then in 1985, all the teams are like, hmm, let's go ahead and combine to each other. And uh, let's have just one scouting combine because this, this ain't working out a whole lot. And that was one week after the Super Bowl in sunny Arizona, the campus of Arizona State, because it was considered to have excellent outdoor facilities and the timing of the year. Well, hey, <laughs> right after the Super Bowl, it's going to be cold everywhere else. Let's have it in Arizona. But Greg Gabriel the former director of player scouting for the Chicago Bears, he recalls that the chance of rain was supposed to be less than 10%. Well, that 10% turned into 100, as it rained some on two of the days, disrupting workouts. The following year, the Combine, now exclusively ran by National Scouting, was held in New Orleans the week after the Super Bowl XX. That was the first indoor Combine, but to say it was disorganized is an understatement. When the drills were held on the floor of the Superdome, many coaches and scouts would just grab a folding chair and find a place to sit on the field. The team executives who wanted to sit in the stands were blocked from seeing everything. It was a farce. <laughs> well, Greg, uh, how about you tell us what you really thought about this thing? Because uh, seriously, 65 years after the NFL was alive, we still can't figure this thing out. We're just now getting to an indoor scouting combine where all the teams are together and it's crazy disorganized. Kind of makes you think, though, how smooth everything seems now to us on TV when we watch the combine go from one to the next. I mean, sure, there's probably a lot of craziness going on behind the scenes, which we're going to get into a little bit. But first, something else from that 1986 combine. Bo Jackson reportedly hand-timed a 4.12 second in the 40-yard dash. I mean, that is just bananas fast. But watching that play where he ran to the tunnel, ah, Maybe that's so. And Chris Landry, next week's guest, has played a role in the scouting combine every year since its inception. And he shares on his site some of his most memorable moments covering the combine. For instance, he said he clocked Bo Jackson at 4.19. I mean, that's still like superhuman freaky fast. So I'll leave a link to his page with his memorable moments in the show notes, which, by the way, you can get to the show notes through your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, while you're at it, I ask that you please subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes well each and every week. But on to 1987. You see, after that whole shamble in uh, Louisiana, they're like, let's move this thing over to Indianapolis. At the time, it was called the Hoosier Dome. You know, Indiana Hoosiers. Later, it would be named the RCA Dome, and then they would have it there until 2009. But that's not because they went to another city. It's still in Indianapolis, uh, but they had to transfer over to what is now called Lucas Oil Stadium, where the Colts play. So that's like the whole eh, location, (laughs) geographical. It's going to be stuck in Indy probably till the day we all die. But regardless, 2004 was a very landmark moment as well, because that was the first time when the NFL Scouting Combine was showed across the stratosphere. Well, I mean, that's when they played it on TV for us to be able to watch and see those, you know, clock them, watch them run down the field. And, oh, that guy's pretty fast. And dang, I didn't think that guy could do that and all that kind of thing. But 2005, speaking of speed, this is when the surface of the RCA dome changed from AstroTurf to what they call field turf. Now, this resulted in faster 40 times. And it makes you think a little, huh? How much faster? I mean, it's just like twitchy fast, not that, that, that much, but as far as 40-yard dash times goes, whoo-wee. What would that have been for other players been able to run on that type of a turf as opposed to the AstroTurf? Well, kind of important because there used to be a formula for it for them to try to figure out, well, they're running on grass, they're running on AstroTurf, or maybe they're running on the track field. Well, that's what they did. They used a formula. They would always calculate everything back to the player's grass speed as a natural grass, because that's considered to be the slowest of all the surfaces where players are going to run 40s. 
And I guess it makes sense, too, because if that's you're playing on a grass field in a real football game, then right, you want to kind of try to ma- match it up a little bit, even though 40-yard dash doesn't equate into football speed exactly. But you got to have some kind of reference. So what they did, this is from Greg Gabriel again. He said that if a player ran a 4.45 on AstroTurf, they were going to automatically convert that to 4.55 on grass. And then if a player ran a 4.45 on a hard outdoor track, then they're going to convert it to a 4.6 on grass. So they had that whole, you know, everybody kind of fair thing, even though that's not an exact science because, you know, it just isn't going to always work out that way. I'm sure they had some science back to it, but hey, don't have to deal with that anymore because Indy's field turf type surface, the conversions no longer made. Things are more on a, well, I guess you could call a level playing field. I mean, again, 40 yard dash is important to see how fast a dude is, but that doesn't always equate to on the field, true football speed. However, there are other drills and other physical tests that are done at the combine that do make it important. And even though all these things are equated and some can go up the leaderboards and down the leaderboards, that's not even considered the reason why they have the scouting combine in one place for all teams to come together at the same time. The reason? Medical exams. (laughs) medical exams what are you talking about they get medical exams all the time but think about this with all the teams together it's more cost effective it's more time effective the results from all the exams are shared with all the teams players do not have to set up the same mri to be performed many times over for different teams they can have the exact same results from a player for all 32 teams nowadays. So consolidating the camps also allows teams to be more thorough in these exams as in, hey, we got more time with this player, so let's just go ahead and get what we need. So because they had more time, this also allows them to have better and more thorough physical and psychological testing. Uh, The next kind of question is, well, how many players are even at the combine? Well, only about 300. And this is by invitation only. And this comes from the NFL Ops page for what is deemed as automatic ineligibility. As with past combines, draft eligible prospects will not be permitted to participate in any aspect of the combine if a background check reveals a conviction of a felony or misdemeanor involving violence or a use of a weapon, domestic violence, sexual offense, and or sexual assault. The NFL also reserves the right to deny participation of any prospect dismissed by their university or the NCAA. End quote. So they take a stance. But at the same time, teams do have the opportunity to evaluate these players individually so as they follow all league-wide guidelines. Now, what about that invitation-only thing? I mean, who decides? You get 300 total players to come to this combine out of the thousands that are out there? Well, nowadays, the shoulders of the person that this ultimately rests on is one Mr. Jeff Foster the president of National Football Scouting. He's in charge of the combine. And of course, it's not just him, but he has held this position since 2005 and constantly looks to improve this process. I mean, this is a whole nother episode in itself. I'm sure we could have him on. We could have some other guys on to really break down and deep dive into how do you select how many linemen come? How do you select how many quarterbacks? If you bring too many quarterbacks and they're not going to get drafted, what's the point? And now you're leaving some linebackers out. Holy cats, pajamas. That's just got to be mind-boggling to think about how do you decide which 300 lucky ones. The 300 Spartans, these are the ones that last stand. You're going to get here, Leonidas. But then after the players are there, again, the top priority of the combine is to gather all this medical information. And they got to create these electronic medical records, which then will be dispersed and available to all 32 teams. So what do they do? Naturally, you have a medical advisory committee that oversees this entire process of collecting the info. So what they do is they, uh, we'll call it a hack, yeah, they hack in, but no, they they get access to this shared NFL slash NCAA database. So they're going to go through the history of all these players. Most of them, and the exams are going to be standard, you know, do this, check that, head, shoulders, knees, toes, elbows, that kind of thing. But then the advisory committee, they may recommend, ooh, man. This is a red flag. That dude done did something to his hip back in the day. You better do further investigation to see if this thing's going to hold up for more than 1.2 years. So then they'll order some tests, which then the tests will be, of course, you guessed it, available to all 32 teams. But with this, 
comes possibly the biggest challenge of the entire scouting combine. Scheduling. I mean, there's a bunch of things to consider and coordinate in a four-day event. The NFL Ops site says that they start scheduling in mid-October of the previous year, as in last October for this upcoming couple weeks, for until the first day of the combine in February to be able to schedule all these different exams, these MRIs, all these types of things. But they give all the credit to their health partner, Indiana University Health, which is responsible for conducting all the standard testing, but also all these additional studies that are ordered up and prepares a report. So then all the teams can have it, like I said, in that electronic medical report. Let's just give you an example, though, from the website. This is also from Jeff Foster. He stated that in 2013, we did 365 MRIs on 333 players in four days. Each MRI takes about an hour, so it's extremely challenging to just schedule those and make sure they all happen. (laughs) I mean, that's some hardcore scheduling. But that's not it. Each of the 32 teams have the opportunity to conduct up to 60 interviews. Each can last up to 15 minutes. So you're talking 32 times 60 times 15 Boom, on top of all of these medical exams that have to be considered. Man, that is a lot of scheduling. Oh yeah, wait, we got all the on-field things going on. We have the press interviews. You have the, I don't know, the water breaks. Get all these types of things. And you got to pack it into a four-day event, which costs a lot of money for the event. But at the same time, this there's a lot of money riding for these teams in general, because if they whiff on a blue chipper potential first round draft pick to set them back many years. We're talking TV revenues. We're talking all these other things that these teams could be missing out on. That's a pretty big weight to carry when you really break it down and think about it. I mean, with television being introduced, it's a major event beyond just that. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, hey, now you got to schedule commercials in there. So just imagine scheduling as being the most significant proponent of a successful scouting combine. And I didn't even think about it that way until I started reading through this. And I think Jeff Foster and his team are what we can call some unsung heroes in the advancement of the game because, hey, that's a scheduling logistical nightmare that I don't want to tackle. And I'm just glad that they're there and he's been doing it ever since 2005. And he deserves a few high fives from everybody listening to this show. Because even though the scouts have a pretty good idea about each player's on the field performance before the combine starts, they get confirmation from the test performed during this event. This confirmation translates into confidence in drafting players on draft day, leading to the difference between championship teams and, well, uh, my Detroit Lions. And the event offers players great opportunity to showcase their abilities, even if it's in a league beyond the NFL. I mean, hey, you're on showcase if you don't make the NFL for, yeah, you guessed it, the XFL, the CFL, all these other types of leagues. So that's why the website of the National Scouting Combine calls the event the ultimate four-day job interview. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode and were able to gain some gridiron knowledge nuggets about some of the history in the scouting and the combine, two major proponents to a successful NFL franchise. If you like this episode and would like to help support this independent show, you can do so by heading over to thefootballhistorydude.com slash support. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com slash support. Now next week, we're going to stick with the scouting and combine theme by talking to someone that has been involved with every scouting combine since its inception. He's a former NFL scout, coordinator of the Houston Oilers slash Tennessee Titans scouting department, and even served as a coordinator of the combine in 1993. So I think he has a little bit of insider knowledge and he's going to go ahead and share some of his gridiron knowledge nuggets with us. And we're going to learn more about the scouting process and how the combine works and how it has maybe not worked as much in the past and how it will continue to work in the future. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.